Hello, everybody. And I would like to thank the organizers in the beginning for the opportunity um, to speak here. It's really a humbling moment for me. Um, I want to shed some light on the experimental side of CVQKD. Um, let me start off with a brief introduction. Um, I don't want to lose too much time explaining the benefits and, and the opportunities that we have um, by CVQKD. <laughs> they have been mentioned already. Of course, there are still some obstacles, some um, open questions and issues which need to be addressed. Some of them have been addressed very nicely in the previous talks. Um, the one I want to address in this talk is the problem of the local oscillator synchronization. And to go into a bit more detail about this problem, um, the general idea of CVQGD is Alice prepares a coherent state and sends it over to Bob. And Bob, by mixing this weak coherent state with a strong reference signal, the local oscillator, can actually measure the quadrature components of the coherent state sent by Alice. However, in, in order for this to work, um, certain requirements need to be met. Firstly, they, you, you really need a, a frequency and phase locking. So you need a stable frequency and phase relation of Alice's and Bob's uh, laser. And one easy way to provide for this uh, phase, uh, um, stable relation is of course when the quantum signal and the local oscillator originate from one and the same uh, laser. However, this requires for the local oscillator to be transmit, <coughs> transmitted through the channel. And this opens a severe security loophole because if as soon as she has access to the um, local oscillator can perform a calibration attack and make the excess noise that she produces seem smaller than it actually is. So you really want, to be the, lo you really want the, uh, the local oscillator to be truly local. So it should be situated in, in Bob's laboratory, la uh, lab uh, beyond Eve's influence. So um, in order to, to synchronize the local oscillator and Alice's lasers, we need to introduce a third signal, a strong reference signal, which carries all the phase and frequency information that we need. And we call this the pilot tone. The idea is that Bob measures uh, the pilot tone and the quantum signal in an arbitrary phase. So his coordinate system will be arbitrarily uh, rotated. But he gets the reference pulse from the pilot tone and by help of these uh, reference parts, he knows the phase relation between his coordinate system and Alice's coordinate system. And he knows um, to which amount he has to back rotate the signals that he has um, measured. So this would be Bob's raw measurements of the pilot tone and the quantum signal. And you see the pilot tone rotates like a maniac. This is due to, due to a, a slight frequency offset of the signal and the local oscillator. So Bob's first step is to, pop, uh, is to estimate the frequency offset between the two lasers and to compensate for this frequency offset. This doesn't seem to change the data much. The next step for him is to, to get an estimate on the relative phase between his laser and Alice's lasers. And this is the phase estimation. And by phase compensation or by phase recovery, um, Bob is able to recover the states as Alice has sent them. Okay, so this is all done post-measurement. So this poses the question, how can Alice and Bob multiplex and then demultiplex the quantum signal and the pilot tone? One easy way to do it, or the most common way so up to now, is to use a time multiplexing scheme. So Alice prepares a pulse train with alternating reference and signal pulses, pilot tone signal, pilot tone signal. This works very nicely, however, it, has, it does have the disadvantage that it limits the symbol rate. Because in this pulse train, Alice needs to um, preserve uh, time slots for the reference pulse. So what we are proposing instead is a polarization and frequency multiplexing scheme. And not frequency multiplexing, um, uh, not multiplexing of the optical frequency, but multiplexing of the modulation frequency. Let's have a look at the experimental setup and let's start with the transmitter. 
it, it's, it's composed of three parts, mainly. First, Alice prepares a, um, prepares a pulse train of 250 megahertz out of a, a CW laser using Marceda interferometry. The next step is already the crucial part, the part where the polarization and frequency multiplexing takes place. So Alice's laser gets um, split up into two branches and the quantum signal and the piloton each get IQ modulated independently from one another and then recombined with orthogonal polarization. And in particular, in our experiment, the quantum signal gets modulated with a 250 megahertz QPSK modulation. QPSK, this is this modulation alphabet with the four points in, space, in phase space. On the other hand, independently from the signal, the piloton gets modulated <laughs> with a simple one gigahertz uh, cosine function, which yields a very strong, uh, which yields a high amplitude fixed point in phase space, which will be later on used to estimate the relative phase between Alice's and Bob's laser. The third step is, is only um, an attenuation of the signal, an, attenu an attenuation of the relative, of the quantum signal. So the relative power difference between the piloton and the quantum signal is, corresponds in our experiment to roughly a factor of 200. So this is the frequency spectrum of the quantum signal and the piloton. You probably know that um, these two sidebands carry exactly the same information. So you have a redundancy of energy that you transmit. And in order to remove this redundancy and in order to improve the energy information ratio, we performed optical single sideband modulation, which also helped to re reduce the noise. So the, sig the signal and the piloton travel through the fiber. And let's now talk about the receiver. At the receiver, the piloton and the quantum signal get mixed with a local oscillator and then detected by a total of four homodyne receivers. Uh, so we need one homodyne receiver for each basis of piloton and signal. Next step is elect electric filtering um, in order to reduce the noise. We filter both the quantum signal and the piloton. And then comes the digital sig signal processing, similar to the, um, the slide before. Bob first performs a raw measurement in an arbitrary phase. Then he estimates the frequency offset and the, and, and the relative phase. And then he uses this information to back rotate the quantum signals that he measured to re recover Alice's symbols. This corresponds to a high SNR measurement. With low SNR, the phase recovery and frequency offset correction don't seem to make much of a difference. However, um, when we correlate the data sent by Alice with the measurements that Bob made, we can nicely recover the modulation of Alice's symbols. Okay, let's um, talk of results. And when we, uh, our figure of merit, or when we want to know how well does this scheme work, um, our primary indicator is always the excess noise. So you know that a coherent state comes with a portion of intrinsic noise uh, due to the Heisenberg relation. This is what we call one shot noise or one shot noise unit. And the excess noise is the noise or the, var the quadrature variance in addition to the uh, quantum shot noise. And in order to give you an idea of how sensitive CVQKD is to excess noise, uh, let's look at this um, illustration where you can see how much noise can you tolerate in your CVQQT system depending on how long you want your channel to be. For example, if you want to have a 40 kilometer channel, you see that you can only afford a noise of roughly 0.01 shot noise units, so only 1% of the quantum shot noise. So these are the first results that we measured, I want to draw your attention to the excess noise here in the, in the colored cells. We have listed two different numbers, one's the total excess noise, and one the excess noise, excluding the detection noise. This applies to the assumption that an eavesdropper might not have the access to, to the receiver in Bob's laboratory. As I told you before, we performed single sideband modulation, 
And this is the status, uh, this was the status when we submitted to the Qcrypt <coughs> conference. However, in the meantime, we managed not only to suppress one sideband, but, but also to suppress the carrier itself, because it turned out, due to the non-zero line width of the carrier, we had some crosstalk with the quantum signal. And the carrier suppression really improved the situation uh, significantly. So you can see the excess noise that we now measured is better by a factor of two, maybe even a factor of three. So we are now in a really low, low noise level. The carrier suppression really made a big difference. For comparison, we also made a measurement with self-homodyning, so a measurement where the quantum signal and the, and the local oscillator originate from the same laser, so they have a, a stable frequency and phase correlation. And we see that our phase recovery scheme does introduce no penalty at all with respect to uh, the easier way of self homodyning So we wanted, to quanti uh, we wanted to quantify the remaining noise, the remaining phase noise after the phase recovery, um, after the phase recovery. And this is what our theoretical model predicts. And I invite you to visit our poster to learn more about our noise models in CVQKD. These are the results that we measured. Um, we are only able to um, measure the, the receiver noise isolated from the others, but we, we cannot decompose this residual noise. However, what we can say is that the remaining phase noise after phase um, recovery cannot be bigger than, than this gray sector. So we know um, that we do not introduce a noise bigger than this number. So it's sort of difficult to speak of uh, uh, key rates due to many reasons. Firstly, because you have to meet a lot of assumptions. Um, and secondly, or more critically even, as you know, or as I told you before, we use a discrete modulation scheme, a QPSK modulation scheme. And as you saw in the previous talks, this is still an open question on which the theorists are working on. So what we did was to take our measurements and our symbol rate that we had. And we, we computed or simulated the key rate, assuming we would have done a Gaussian modulation. After all, this phase recovery scheme that we are um, presenting works just as fine for any kind of modulation, including Gaussian modulation. OK, this would be the key rate over three different distances under the assumption that an eavesdropper has access to the entire excess noise. Okay. However, under the more relaxed assumption <coughs> that the um, receiver noise is not attributed to Eve, you get higher key rates. And you can, as we were even able to transmit the non-zero key or a decent non-zero key even over 40 kilometer distance uh, deployed fiber in the city of Vienna. There is a, a QPSK proof available in literature. However, it's not a very tight one. And we found out that if we apply our measurements to this uh, QPSK proof, which is mentioned here, we obtain no key at all. Um, this is, however, not because the noise was not low enough. It's much rather because we operated at a too high signal-to-noise ratio, at a too high SNR, because this security proof, it really requires very low <coughs> photo numbers, roughly order of magnitude 0.1 photons at the receiver, uh, pardon, at, at the transmitter. However, under, under, um, so we optimized the <laughs> modulation variance and were even able to demonstrate a non-zero key over 13 kilometers using this very strict QPSK proof. So this is a short um, collection or uh, a, a comparison between publications which have already demonstrated this local local oscillator scheme, and uh, these two use this uh, time multiplexed um, scheme that I presented before. I do not claim that this list is complete. However, I hope you agree that, that we can see from, from this table that our system allows for very high symbol rates compared to the others and can be operated at very low noise level <laughs> when you compare it to the others. This already brings me to the conclusions. Um, I presented a pilot-assisted phase recovery and frequency offset correction scheme for CVQKD. Um, it closes an important 
security loophole because now Alice's and Bob's laser are really truly independent from one another and you do not need to transmit the local oscillator. We use for the first time as a, a, um, polarization and frequency multiplexing scheme for signal and piloton, which allows for very high uh, key rates, or very high symbol rates, and can be operated at really low noise level. So I do not claim that this system that I presented is the most advanced that has ever been uh, developed. Other groups are doing terrific work. What I do claim is that this is really a promising candidate for any, uh, so w when it comes to uh, synchronizing the local oscillator, this is a promising candidate for any future CVQQD application. Thank you very much.